In this chapter, we will be studying quadratic functions. All right, we're now going to start a chapter on quadratic functions. Okay, we're going to look at, uh, first of all, the characteristics of quadratic functions here. Now, when we do this, it really, it's just going to be a lot of information uh, coming at you right away, real fast. And then what we'll do is we'll start to do some questions together and, and kind of rely on some of this information here. Okay, so let's, let's zoom in a little bit here. So to start off with, okay, when we take a look at, oops, when we take a look at a quadratic function, um, these are functions that are degree two, okay? Uh, therefore, they have an x squared somewhere in them, okay? So our independent variable is being squared somewhere in the expression here. Now, there are three important ways that we can write these quadratic functions here. We can write it as y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, maybe I really should zoom in on that. Okay, and we call this the standard form. Okay, that's just the standard uh, way you're going to write that. Now, in terms of what we are going to do with quadratics, this is probably the least useful. However, when you compare it to other, other functions, higher degree functions, even, even a linear function here, this method of writing it out is probably the, the one way that we can do it that kind of links them all together. That's why it's a standard form. Okay, if it's a cubic we're working with, it would be ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. And that, that'd just be like the standard way of writing polynomials like that. So anyway, there's our standard form. And notice it's y equals, because for right now we're dealing with quadratic functions. We're looking at a relationship between x and y. Okay, so ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, the other way of writing this is called the vertex form. Now, in terms of what you're going to see in this particular chapter, in this course, this is probably the most useful one that we're going to, uh, to look at, okay? Um, and you're going to see Im immediately why that's so, because uh, it's very easy to link this, this equation right here, this form of the equation, to the graph of this function, okay? Just like when you're dealing with linear functions, and re remember linear functions when you looked at y equals mx plus b, and how easy this one was to graph because you, you knew this was the slope and right here this was the y-intercept. Very, very similar sort of, of level of usefulness here when you're talking with the vertex form. And then lastly, we've got this, what we call this intercept form, y equals a times x minus r times x minus x, uh, s here. This is the intercept or factored form. Okay, this is called the intercept or factored form. And r and s are the roots of the equation, or, or it turns out to be they're the x-intercepts of the graph, okay? These particular values where the graph crosses the x-axis. Okay, now, you already know then a couple things about the, the quadratic. Okay, you know it's got a, a, a squared, an x and a, uh, squared in there somewhere. Notice here you're not seeing the x-squared, but if you were to expand this out, you would necessarily have to get an x-squared in this particular form of the equation. So it's still there, okay? Now let's take a quick look at what the graph looks like. Now over here, when we drew this, y equals mx plus b, you know that you're getting a straight line, okay? That's a linear function. A quadratic function actually looks like this, and the shape that we're giving it here, okay, is actually called uh, a parabola, okay? The shape of this graph here is called a parabola, and it's got some pretty interesting properties. Now it's got a lot of interesting properties that we're not going to get into in this course because it's just not not the uh, place for it right now. It's not in the curriculum here. But if you were to study uh, parabolic mirrors in, in physics, you know that these things have got this focal point, okay, and the way the things reflect off that and, and focus on that point right there. Uh, that is all uh, very easily derivable in, in mathematics. It's just that that's not part of this course. What you need to know is that it's got this kind of a bowl shape to it, okay? And actually, it's not written out here, right, right here, but I'm going to give it a name. Okay, regardless of whether it opens up or down, the, the key feature of this is that it's got this minimum point or this maximum point, okay? And we call those points here the vertex. This is the vertex of this parabola. This one here is the vertex of this parabola, parabola. okay? It's either the minimum point or the maximum point of the parabola. It has it. Now, a straight line doesn't have a property like that. It doesn't have a max or a min, but a parabola does, okay? So, we're going to take a look at just some examples of some quadratic functions here, just so that you see them here. Uh, basically, just written in terms of x and y. y is equal to x squared minus 6. That's all you need. Okay? Now, if it's got an x cubed in there somewhere, even if, it's, even if it does have an x squared, if you throw an x cubed in there anywhere, it's no longer quadratic. Okay? It, the dominant, the highest degree function uh, or term takes over. 
So as long as the x squared is the highest one, that's okay. Cover that up, that's still quadratic, right? But as soon as you get rid of that, it's no longer quadratic. Now we're just going to use some function notation here. So g of h is equal to this one here is written in vertex form. f of x looks like this. This is in your root uh, form, your uh, factored form. And then here h of x is equal to x squared plus 7x plus 12. There's your, there's your standard form. Okay? Awesome. These are not quadratic functions. Okay? Not quadratic because the degree on the x isn't 2. If there was a square right here, that would qualify as quadratic, but it's not there. Now here, this one might be a little confusing because you're looking at it saying, well, there's a square there, and yeah, that's true, but the square root is actually going to eliminate that. These are like inverse functions of each other, and so the square root of that x plus 2 squared is going to leave you with just x plus 2. Now it's, there's a little bit more involved in it than just what I've just said there, but suffice it to say that's going to uh, kind of get rid of what makes this a quadratic, what makes it a parabolic shape here. If you were to graph this thing, you would not get that nice curve there. Here, you've still got the x squared in there, but because it's in the denominator, this one here is actually a rational. Okay, this one is a rational expression. It's a little bit more complicated when it's rational. You are going to see that you actually do get a, a curve to the graph, but it doesn't curve in the same way that you would expect for a regular parabola here. So that's a little different here. Okay, I want, right now in this chapter, I want the square term, I want everything to be up in the numerator. I don't want anything in the denominator. I don't want any x's, I should say, in the denominator. I don't mind having like numbers. I don't mind having fractions in there. Okay, so if you want like another example here, I might have like one-third x squared plus one-fifth. That's okay. That's still a good quadratic. But as soon as the x drops into the denominator, nah, it qualifies to be a rational instead. All right, so now, Let's take a quick look at, at this guy right here. A uh, little note here, always refer to your reference parabola. So what do we mean by reference parabola? Well, what I mean here is the simplest, most straightforward, basic parabola I can give you, y equals x squared. I mean, that is the absolute minimum I need to have a parabola. And when you graph that, this is what you get. Okay. So 0, 0 ends up being our vertex. Okay. If I go 1 over, Remember, this is the y coordinate is simply based on the x coordinate squared. So one over square that, I go one up. One squared gets me one. If I go to the left here, I go down to where x is negative one. Well, negative one squared. Remember, negative times negative becomes a positive. Positive two squared is is four. That's why two comma four. Negative two squared is also four because the squaring gets rid of the negative here, and this is going to curve up. And what I really want you to notice, and this is going to become really helpful here, is that when you start at the vertex, okay, when you're talking about just a regular parabola without having done anything to it, when you go one over, I then take a jump one up, and I'm back on the parabola. The way the curve goes here, when you move one unit over, you jump one up. One unit over, I would jump one up, regardless of whether I go left or right. If you go two units over, then you jump four up because you're, squ you're squaring. Whatever the horizontal motion is that you take away from the vertex, you're going to square that uh, to get back up to the parabola. That's just the way that works. But the easiest, the most straightforward example of that right here is one over, one up. I want you to bear that in mind here, okay? We're going to come back to that idea in a little while. All right. Now we're going to discover the characteristics of the quadratic functions that we can glean out of the equation once it's written in vertex form. Zoom up just a, whoops, zoom up just a little bit here. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the characteristics of the graphs of the quadratic functions, and we're going to focus specifically on the vertex form. Okay? So, first of all, the vertex is the tip of your graph. It's the turning point. Okay? It's where the, the graph, if you want to think of it like this, you can take a look at the examples that we've got here. It's where the parabola changes directions. Now, you always read, okay, we always read, always read these things uh, left to right. Always read them. You always read when you read. You read left to right. Okay? So when we read this thing left to right, notice that the graph drops, turning point, and then starts to go up again. Or, likewise, it goes up, 
hits the vertex, turns around, and comes back down again. Okay? So that's, that's what the vertex represents here, a point where the graph changes directions. It's now, when I say change directions, I mean either going up or down. I'm not going to change directions left or right. I'm always going to go left to right. That's just the nature of the, the function that we're working with here. But whether I'm going up or down could change. So it goes down, change directions, goes up. Comes up, change directions, goes down. So you got to bear in mind uh, the way that works. Now the vertex here, we can get a little bit more specific here. This little note here says that uh, always, uh, sorry, the vertex here is always written as coordinates and we grab those uh, from the P and the Q in the formula. Yoink. The P and the Q. Now notice what we're seeing inside here is X minus P. That minus out front might cause a little bit of difficulty. You just got to bear in mind that in the vertex form, there is a negative sign right there. Okay, that's going to affect how I read the p-value. The q-value is fine. There's a positive inside it, that in front of it. That doesn't mean anything. So you'll see what I mean in just a second here. So here's some examples here. This one, and I know that's maybe not super clear, so let's see if we can get it in, come in a little bit here. So this is y equals x minus 2 squared plus 1. Now my p-value here, bearing in mind that that minus is supposed to be there, that subtraction is supposed to be there, so my vertex here should be the number, uh, the point 2 comma 1. And if you look at it, yeah, it is. 2 over, 1 up, there's my turning point. Okay? So I'm seeing x minus 2 in there, but I know that that's got to correspond to positive 2 because I should be subtracting the p-value. Uh, here, my equation is negative x plus 3 squared uh, plus 4. Okay, well, I'm looking at this again. That's, that's supposed to be a negative inside there. That's supposed to be a negative. It should be minus. So the only way I can, I, I can kind of think this thing through, not noodle it through as to, like, why did that, I know it's supposed to be subtraction, so why did it become addition here, is if I'm subtracting a negative. That's the only way I can kind of see that happening. In which case, that means my vertex here would be the point negative 3 comma 4. And actually, if you look at the, the point where this thing changes directions, it's exactly what it is. 3 to the left, 4 up, negative 3 comma 4. That's where this graph changes directions. Okay. Now this one over here, again in vertex form now, it's, uh, this isn't 100% clear here, but it's supposed to be uh, 2x and this is plus 2. So again, uh, that should be subtraction there. That should be y equals 2x minus, and again the only way I can kind of get get it clear in my head as to why that is supposed to be um, positive there is if it's x minus negative 2 squared uh, minus 2. And so in this case here, again, I see that p is supposed to be negative 2. q is, I can read that right off easily. There's not a problem there. Minus 2. So my vertex here would be the point negative 2, negative 2. And when I look at the actual graph here, I can see, yeah, that is true. Okay. Uh, I am hitting the the point negative 2 comma negative 2. All right, now let's expand on this idea a little bit here. We're going to introduce this thing called an axis of symmetry. Now before, before we talk about specifically what this is, let's talk about symmetry. What does symmetry mean? Well, most of us are, are pretty aware of what symmetry means. Symmetry means that something is the same kind of on, on both sides. There's like a reflected image sort of thing. Um, let me show you here. Uh, well, here. This little guy right here. Humans. <laughs> okay. Humans are bilaterally symmetric. Now, his hair here is a little off because it's parted on one side. But if I pop his hair off, okay, you could slice this guy right down the middle and he would be the same on both sides, okay? The one side would be the mirror image of the other, I mean roughly speaking here. And that's essentially what happens here with a quadratic, okay? The quadratics here uh, can be cut in half. Like if you come up here, if I drop a line straight through the middle of these things, this side and this uh, side right here, they're mirror images of each other. That's what we mean by axis of symmetry. So it's the vertical line that divides your graph or your parabola Okay, in half. Now, when you look at what's inside your 
your equation here in vertex form, essentially what's going on here is it's this little bit right here. Okay, if you want to think of it this way. Bear in mind that P ends up being the, the Y, sorry, the X coordinate of the vertex. So essentially here, one way of doing this is to simply state this. That right there is the equation of the axis of symmetry. Whatever's inside the parentheses here, equal to zero, there's your axis of symmetry. If you try to solve for X, you get X equals P. And if you think back to math 10, that's the equation of a vertical line that goes through the X coordinate P. Okay, and that's what you're getting right here. So the equation of the axis of symmetry is either X minus P equals zero, or X plus P equals zero. I mean, it depends if that number in there is positive or negative when you start off with. And then it becomes this X equals P or X equals negative P. Okay, so down here, this one right here, for your, just your straightforward Y equals X squared parabola, our vertex here is the point zero, zero. The axis of symmetry is X equals zero. And if you think about what we're doing here is what are you squaring in this equation? Well, I'm squaring the X. And so you set that equal to zero. That's how you get your, your axis of symmetry, at, at least when it's written in vertex form. Uh, over here, I haven't really given you the equation of the, the parabola here in this case, but you can see the vertex right here. The vertex is the point three comma one. So I start here one, two, three, go up one. And so my axis of symmetry is going to be the equation X equals three. Okay, X is gonna be equal to the, the X coordinate of the vertex or if you want it to look all fancy there, x minus 3 is equal to 0. And over on this last one right here, the equation that we've got here is f of x equals negative 2 uh, x minus 3 squared plus 1. So what we might do here is take that x minus 3, the part that's being squared here, set it equal to 0, or, or solve for x there, and either one of those is totally acceptable as your, as your equation for the axis of symmetry. Okay, it just identifies the vertical line that goes through the X coordinate of the uh, vertex. That's all it is. And so all I really have to do is identify X is equal to that coordinate. And really what that does is that identifies every point that has that identical X coordinate, X equals three. Now, let's keep going here. Some more, more things to talk about. Uh, so we talked about the axis of symmetry here. When we talk about the vertex, uh, there are a couple of ways that you can talk about it. That vertex is also going to be associated with either the minimum value or the maximum value of the parabola. Now, as soon as we start referring to the value, we are referring to the Y coordinate. Okay? Referring to the Y coordinate. So, you're going to have a minimum value only if the graph opens up. Okay? So as long as the graph does this, you're going to have a minimum value right here. There is no maximum value because the graph is going to extend up infinitely. Okay, so there is no maximum to it, but there is that minimum there. Okay, it's the Y value of the vertex or, or the Q value of the vertex if you want to think of it like that. Now, that is going to be related to the range and that's the idea of domain and range. Man, once you learn those in Math 10, those concepts you are stuck with, they are so important in all sorts of different uh, applications, all different sorts of branches of mathematics here. So you want to be really, really comfortable with these ideas. So if you've got a minimum value, if the graph opens up, then your range is going to be Y is greater than whatever that minimum value is. So in this case right here, when I give you the equation in this form, I know that the vertex is going to be P comma Q. Change the sign there for P, but it stays the same for Q. If this is a parabola that opens up, I know that my range will be Y is greater than or equal to Q, okay? So just here's a couple pictures here. There's my vertex, that's a minimum. Uh, in this particular case here, the vertex was the point uh, three, negative four. That means my minimum value, okay? The min value here is negative four which means my range is going to be y is greater than or equal to negative four. Now compare that with the concept of the maximum value, which again occurs if the parabola opens down. So as long as the parabola does this, this is going to have a maximum value right there. This thing drops down infinitely. Again, we're talking about the y coordinate of the vertex. 
And so in this case, our range would be less than or equal to whatever that maximum value is. So now, now we're going to give you a hint as to how you can tell because this is the only, this is the first time that it, it will be obvious what's going on. As soon as you put a negative value multiplied in front of this, this set of parentheses here being squared, that's going to actually force this graph to open down. It causes what we, what we call here a, a vertical reflection. Okay? In other words, without it, the parabola opens up. And as soon as you put a negative there, it switches the parabola uh, over so that it opens down. So up here, when this parabola opened up, it's because the A value here was positive. Now, as soon as this, this A value here is negative, the parabola is going to open down and you're going to be left with a, a maximum value. And your maximum value is going to be the Q value again. Okay? And in this case, my range would then be Y is less than or equal to Q. So over here, my vertex here is the point 3 comma 1. My maximum value here is going to be the Y coordinate at, at 1. And my range, therefore my range is going to be Y is less than or equal to 1. Now, finally, we want to talk about X and Y intercepts here. And this is no different than you would have done in, in Math 10. So here, my X intercepts for this one, for example, will be negative 2 and positive 2. My Y intercept here is going to be, what is that, negative 4. 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. So I'm just counting out if these are the points where I cross the X axis, and this is the point where I cross the Y axis. Okay? And so you can see us here, this is, they're looking at the same graph here. They're just identifying here are the X intercepts, here's the Y intercepts. So here, my X intercepts, when I take a quick look at this, will be negative 1, whoops, sorry, that doesn't look right. Okay, will be negative 1 and 1, 2, 3, 3. Notice I'm not saying x-intercepts equals negative 1 and 3 because I'm not creating an equation here. Okay, I'm not, because an equation is something that I can graph. It would be like a line. I don't want that. I'm just listing the numbers that qualify as x-intercepts. Okay, so negative 1 comma 3. And I'm using a little colon there. My y-intercept, the point where this thing crosses the y-axis is going to be down here at negative 3. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some, some example, uh, examples of questions that you could get asked. We'll look at a quick summary first of everything we've just done and then do some specific questions. All right, so in general, when we're looking at the equation of, the, of a quadratic function here in vertex form, if that number up front here is positive, then this thing is going to open up and you're going to have a minimum value. If, on the other hand, it's negative, this thing opens down, and you're going to have a maximum value. And those maximum values are going to be Q. Okay? So the minimum value will be Q, the maximum value would be Q. Uh, the vertex here is going to be the, the coordinates of that point will be P, Q. Notice I've got to change the sign here from whatever number I see inside the parentheses because I'm going to be subtracting the P value. And then the Q value is okay. Whether it's positive or negative, it's going to stay positive or negative. The axis of symmetry occurs where whatever's inside here being squared is set equal to zero. So X minus P equal to zero. And then that can be written as X equals P. Okay, so now let's take a look at some, uh, some questions, sorts of things you might get asked. And the first thing we're going to look at here is we're going to ask, ask you to fill in the blanks to describe what you're seeing here. So make sure you can see the graph there. So take a look at this graph right here. I can read off its vertex uh, very simply here. That's going to be negative 3 comma 0. There's my vertex. Now, notice what I'm not doing. I'm not just listing the numbers. I'm not just putting this as negative 3 comma 0 without the parentheses. Without the parentheses, it's not a point. Okay? The parentheses are very important here for communicating this, this correctly here. So the vertex here is going to be negative 3, 0. There's the point here. The axis of symmetry is x equals the x-coordinate of the axis of symmetry. So once I know the vertex, I know the axis of symmetry. Does it have a max or a min value? Well, this thing has a min value, and the minimum value here is 0. Okay, that's related to the y-coordinate of the, the vertex. So that's what we're getting out of the vertex. 
Vertex gives us our axis of symmetry. It gives us our max or min value. This one's a min because the graph opens up. The x-intercept here is just going to be negative 3. The y-intercept, okay, the y-intercept I got to read off the graph here. Yeah, it looks like it's 9. My domain, okay, is going to be all reals. I have to assume because when the graph goes to the end of the, the Cartesian plane that I'm seeing right here, the, the, the plot here, I have to assume that it implies that it keeps going. And a parabola is going to keep going to the left and the right forever and ever. Okay? Um, there is no number out there that you can't square and then either add or subtract something to. So the f equation that I create here is going to apply to all values of x, no matter which negative ones or positive ones you use. So the domain is going to be all reals. The range, however, the values that you get out as a result, okay, those are going to be limited. So the y coordinates that I get, remember this parabola opens up, so the range is going to be greater than or equal to some minimum value here, and the minimum value that I get, again, is associated with the, the y coordinate here, the vertex, that's going to be zero. So the range will be y is greater than or equal to zero. Now let's take a look at the next one. Okay, and so here, you see the parabola opens up, okay? And here's the turning point right here, okay? We slide down to our minimum and then we go back up again, always moving to the right. And the point here, the coordinates are 2, and then down here at negative 6. So the vertex is the point 2, negative 6. Okay? Now, from there, just like before here, that immediately tells me the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry will be x is equal to 2. Okay, the x coordinate of that. And that's that vertical line. Okay, right here. Vertical line, all the x coordinates there are 2, cuts the parabola in half. Max or min value? Well, this one has a min. Okay, because the parabola opens up, so it's got a min value, and that value is related to the vertex here, and it's going to be negative 6. Now, the intercepts are easy enough to uh, read off here. They're going to be x intercepts will be negative 1 uh, and 5. The y intercept here, uh, okay, well, the y intercept isn't quite so clear. Uh, it doesn't quite look like 3 and a half there, so I, let's say uh, negative 3.5. Two five. Let's say negative three, or actually, it might be easier to not assume it was a quarter there, and just say negative three point three. Let's say, okay, because it's it's a little bit past negative three, not quite at three and a half there. Yeah, there we go. A domain. Oh, okay. Well, the domain is a parabola, and just like before, the domain will be all reals. That's not going to change from question to question. The range, however, will. Because we know that it had a minimum of negative 6, that means my range is going to be all y coordinates greater than or equal to negative 6. Okay? And so there's all that information that we want to yank out of this parabola. Let's do another one. Okay, take a look at this guy right here. This one opens down. The vertex. Well, what's the vertex here? Okay, well, it goes over. Uh, what's going, as, sorry, as we go from uh, left to right here, we go up and then back down. So our turning point here is at the, the num, uh, point 3, 2. So my axis of symmetry, just like before, is going to be related to my vertex. It's going to be the, the line x equals positive 3. And that's that vertical line that cuts that parabola in half. Uh, this one here, because it opens down, has a maximum value, not a minimum value, a maximum value, and the maximum value related to the vertex there, again, is going to be 2. Uh, my x-intercepts are going to be 2 and 4. You can read that right off the graph here. Now, notice in this case we're not asking for the y-intercept. That's because you can't read it off the graph. Now we're going to see shortly here that you actually have enough information right now to figure out what the y-intercept is. Okay? We just got to give you the algebraic tools to do that. And that's where we're headed. We'll, we'll get there soon. But all that information that you need, it's all right there. Now my domain, just like before, is going to be x is an element of the reals, meaning all values. My range, because I know that this was a maximum, all of my y values are going to be less than or equal to that maximum value, which in this case we saw was 2. All right? There's all that bit of information that you can yank out of there. Okay, good. Let's take a look at another question here. And we got a chart. Let me zoom out a little. Whoops, let me zoom out a little bit here. So you can see the chart. Uh, okay, we're going to just be able to fit everything in there. That's good. Okay, so we're going to fill this in. Complete the table given the vertex form. Okay. 
So let's just kind of run down all of these so that we get used to grabbing that bit of information here. So the direction of opening, we saw that that was related to the value that's in front. Actually, maybe what I'll do here, I'm gonna give myself a little bit of room. Okay, maybe what we'll do is we will zoom in and we'll go down each, each row here. So the direction of opening here, because of the negative, this thing is going to open down. This leading coefficient here is positive, it will open up. This leading coefficient here is positive, this will open up. This leading coefficient here is negative, it will open down. Now, when I say leading coefficient, I don't, I don't always mean the first number that I see. But if it's written properly, that's, that's the, th the answer that's going to be here. It will be the first number here. But essentially, you need to think of that more as it's the coefficient of the highest degree term. Okay? So I'm looking for the number that's multiplied in front of the, the x squared. Now, in this case here, this whole thing is squared. The number out front is negative. Here, the whole thing is being squared, so that x is part of it. The number out front is positive. Same thing here. And then here, it's negative again. The vertex. And I, ho I hope you're comfortable enough to yank this thing out here. The vertex, when I look inside the, the parentheses here, I take the opposite sign there. So this is going to be negative 3. And then the value out here, I just take it the way it sits. Negative 4. So there's my vertex. Here, vertex, I look inside the parentheses. Take the opposite sign there. It's going to be 9. And then, well, okay, if I don't see it out here, what number have I added? And the answer is 0. So this would be 9, 0. For this next one here, I look at what's inside here, and I've got this, take the opposite sign, so it's going to be 5. Look at what's being added at the end here. That's 1, so the vertex here is 5, 1. Now here, I look at what's being squared. Now, please don't tell me that the x-coordinate is, is going to be positive, sorry, negative 6. That 6 is being added after the square. Every time I grab that number, after the square, that was the y-coordinate of the vertex. That 6 is coming after the square. It's the y-coordinate of the vertex. So what am I squaring then? Well, don't think of it as the 5. The 5 is the number that's out front. You might want to rewrite this as negative 5 x minus 0 squared plus 6. If that helps you, sorry, give you a little bit of clarity on that. And so the x-coordinate here that I'm looking for is actually going to be 0. 0 comma 6. And that's what you get when you see the x when there's no parentheses. Notice that parentheses, 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 no parentheses, the x coordinate was 0. Okay, max min value. Now I want to be a little bit more specific. I know this is going to be the y coordinate of each one of those vertices. Okay, we've already established that. Now the question is, is this a max or a min? Well, this one opens down, parabola opens down. So that means that point must be the maximum. The vertex is the top. It opens up. It's the min. So if, if it opens up, we're talking about something that does this. That vertex is the, the minimum, the lowest value. Same thing here if it opens up. And then again, if it opens down, then the vertex is going to be the maximum value. So the max is negative 4. The min is 0. Min is 1. Max is 6. Equation of the axis of symmetry. Well, okay, well, that's, that's pretty straightforward because it's going to be x equals x equals x equals x equals. And we grab those numbers from the x-coordinates of the vertices. So negative 3, 9, 5, and 0. Okay. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, actually, <laughs> what this particular... Uh, uh, line of column of this table is asking for axis of symmetry at um, I am assuming this is asking for the same thing just in a slightly different way it's at x equal to negative 3 x equals 9 x equals 5 x equals 0 okay uh, actually sorry now that I think about it <clears throat> the expectation here for this axis of symmetry even though this is this is not necessarily have to be this way Okay, but you might actually have, have thought of it as, in this case here, x plus 3 equals 0. Oops. Just bring that negative 3 over to the other side. x minus 9 equals 0. Bring the 9 over. x minus 5 equals 0. And then down here, there's really nothing to do. It's still going to be x equals 0. But they might have been looking for the equation in, in this form. 
okay, which we might call uh, general form. Either way, anyway. Uh, domain and range, okay. Well, domain is going to be pretty straightforward. For every parabola that we've looked at, it was x is an element of the reals. Okay, and until we start looking at word problems, that's, that's fair. It's, they're all going to be x is an element of the reals. My range is actually going to be related to what we did over here, the max min value. So if the maximum is negative 4, that means my range has got to be less than or equal to negative 4. All my y coordinates are going to be less than or equal to that maximum. A minimum of 0 means that all of the y coordinates of the graph, which is what the range is asking for, the y coordinates, all of my y coordinates are greater than or equal to 0 because 0 is the min. Here, all of my y coordinates will be greater than or equal to 1. And here, all of my y coordinates will be less than or equal to the maximum value of 6. Okay? Uh, okay, I hope that, I hope that makes sense. Uh, charts like this are usually good uh, for a nice kind of condensed way of looking at all of these different features at once. We'll now answer some questions using the graphic display calculator. All right, now we're going to look at how to use the graphing calculator to analyze quadratics. Now, and although I'm specifically talking about how to analyze quadratics here, I, I hope you kind of walk away from this realizing that, that this, these tools that I'm about to show you here can be expanded to be used for a whole bunch of different things. When you take your calculator and press second trace here, now maybe I should explain it like this. When you graph something on the calculator, the first thing you're going to do is press y equals right here. That opens up a whole bunch of these expressions here, y is equal to. So you'll enter in your equation and then you'll press the graph button over here, okay? Now once you've done that, you've got a graph uh, on your calculator, okay, and let's, just for convenience sake, let me press x squared here. Uh, and if you've never done this before here, maybe I should clarify that. This is typically the button you're going to use for your variables, okay? Come up here. This button here has got my x, my tau, my theta, my n. Now, you might not be familiar with the tau, theta, and n there. Don't worry about it. You, those will come later on here. But this is my variable button, okay, when I'm graphing. Uh, so what I'll do here is I will press x uh, and then squared. So right there, zoom in a bit. There's my function. I'm going to press graph. And then it draws the parabola for me. Now. What we're trying to address here is uh, we're trying to show you where these tools are on your calculator. So here's my calculator. I've got that, that graph uh, done there. I'm going to press the button trace, okay, or sorry. Well, actually, let's talk about what that does too. If you just press trace here, what the calculator does now, if you move your arrow keys left and right here, what it does is it moves the, the cursor along the graph and it gives you the coordinates of the point where the cursor is at underneath. Which is, can be, well, it can be quite useful here. But really what we want to do is we want to press second trace because that's going to access this calc menu and that opens up this, this menu right here. Now, I want to go through what each one of these things does. Or at least the ones that are of, of significance to us. The first one there, value, lets you find, uh, well, it, Specifically, we're going to use it to find the y-intercept, but it basically lets you find any y-value if you know what the x-value is. It'll ask you x equals what, you tell it, and it'll tell you what the y-value is. The zero feature right here is used to find the x-intercept. Man, this is an important one. Okay, the reason why it's called zero here is because in order for you to find the, y, uh, the x-intercepts, okay, I am going to let y become zero. So when we, when we let our function equal zero, okay, we call that the zero of the function. It makes sense. Now it's not where x goes to zero. Okay, that's the y-intercept. This is where the function goes to zero. And then I'm going to use that to solve for the value of x here. This is the, these are the x-intercepts graphically, but we call those again the zeros of the function. Now minimum and maximum, these two features here we're going to use to find the vertex depending on whether the parabola opens up, minimum, or down, maximum. So you've got to know a little bit about what's going on with the, the parabola or the function first. Now something later on that we're going to use in this course, it's not mentioned here, uh, we're going to use this intersect feature here. This is where two graphs intersect. 
which will become uh, useful later on in this course here. These last two are tools that will get used in a calculus course. We're not even going to, uh, I'm not even going to describe for you what those are right now because uh, I don't want to confuse you with that. Another thing you should be aware of here is what happens when you press your window button. Okay, so here's our, pro our, sorry, our calculator again. If you press the window button, what you're seeing here are the dimensions of the, the graphing screen. So press my window button again. This tells me that my minimum x value is negative 10, my maximum value is 10, and that my scale is going up by 1. So that means down here, this value right here is negative 10, this value up here is positive 10, and each one of these little marks is going up by 1. Uh, if I press window again, and it tells me that my y minimum is negative 10, my y maximum is positive 10, and my y scale is 1. And that means this is down here is negative 10, up here is positive 10, and the scale is going up by 1. Now, there's a little bit of extra information given here. Don't worry about those. Uh, they're not going to affect anything that we're doing right now. Okay. In fact, they won't be an issue for, for a while. Okay. So now, let's go to the bottom of the screen here. Let's use our calculator and graph the following and then fill in the, the blanks here. So, okay, the function that we're trying to graph here is y equals 2 times x plus 3 squared minus 4. Okay. So, whoops, sorry. I'm going to go back to my home page and we're going to walk you right through this. So, y equals, okay, I'm going to get rid of that function that was in there by pressing the clear button. Now I'm going to enter this in 2, 2, and then bracket. I wanted x plus 3. So here we go. Here's x plus 3. We'll close the brackets and see what I got. 2, x plus 3. I want this to be squared, so I'm going to hit my square button right here. So there's my 2, x plus 3 squared, and then in the, in the, uh, on the page here I'm subtracting 4. So I'm going to use this one, not this one. This is the negative button. This is subtraction. Okay, this is, I would use this at the beginning of, a, of an expression if the first value that I was working with was negative. This is my subtraction, subtract 4. So there's the function that I wanted to graph here, 2 times x plus 3 squared minus 4. Okay, so there's what my parabola looks like. Now, I'd like to transfer that over to here. Uh, notice, notice the grid that I've got here. Let's take a look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. This goes back, well, roughly to six. It goes forward to six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this, notice that the scale here is negative six to six, negative six to six. Let's change the window to match that. Okay? So this is the case here. I'm going to put negative six in there. This time I want to use this as my negative. So negative six. 6 going up by 1's is fine, and then for the y coordinate it's negative 6, again using that negative button, 6. Now I'll graph that. Okay. Now it would help me out if I could see those, those grid lines here. So I'm going to show you something else the calculator can do here. Uh, if you go into your format menu right here by pressing second, zoom, okay, one of the things that you can do here is turn on uh, the grid. So in my calculator, I can turn on the grid line. Now, you might only be able to turn on the dots, and that's okay. But I press enter here to turn on my grid line, and now when I press graph, it shows me everything. Okay? And now I can actually pretty accurately convert or transfer this over to my grid here. I can see that my, my vertex here is going to be negative 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4, negative 3, negative 4. So 1, 2, 3, one, two, three, four. Okay. I can see that my x intercepts here looks like, uh, is that it's roughly negative one and a half. Two, three, four. Negative four and a half. So negative one and a half. One, two, three, four. Negative four and a half. And my y intercept, ah, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, one, oh, I can't even see it on the, the screen here. It goes right off. So my parabola here is going to look something like. that right there. So there's my graph. Now we're going to look at the vertex. Now I already knew that the vertex was negative 3, negative 4. I mean I could have told you that. But let's, let's use the calculator to figure that out. I'm going to go into the trace menu. And because my parabola opens up, I'm going to use the minimum. And so what the calculator does is it asks me for a left bound. Now I'm going to move my cursor using my left and right arrow keys. 
this is the vertex roughly about there. Now I'm going to move the cursor a little bit to the left and press enter. Now notice that it draws this little triangle here with a line. Now I'm going to move my cursor to the right of the, the vertex, press enter. It draws this other little line right there with a triangle there. The vertex should be between those two lines. Okay, and it is. Now the calculator is asking me for a guess. Don't worry about the guess. Uh, the only time that that would ever be necessary is if you had like a really, really complicated graph, but that's not going to happen in all of high school here. Just press enter. And what that does is that takes the, cal uh, the calculator basically runs back and forth here, kind of spirals in on the lowest value in that interval there. And don't, please don't write negative 2.9999. Understand that that means negative 3, negative 4. Okay. So our vertex here is supposed to be negative 3, negative 4. Now from there, I can answer these next two really quick and easy. My axis of symmetry will be x equals negative 3. Okay, or if you want to write it the other way, x plus 3 equals 0. That's fine too. Uh, my max or minimum value, well the parabola opens up, so this is going to have a min value. And that min value is going to be the y coordinate of the vertex, negative 4. All right, x-intercepts, y-intercepts. Here we go. To figure out the x-intercept, we're going to go back into our trace menu. This time I'm going to use the zero function, zero feature. Now I can only do this one at a time. Okay, can I only do this one at a time here? So I'm going to find this, this x-intercept first here. Now the, the calculator is asking me for a left bound, so I'm going to move the uh, cursor just to the left. Now please don't use the up or down arrow keys here, only use left and right. So I move it to the left, press enter, and just like it did when I was looking for the minimum, it gives me this little triangle with this line. Now I'm going to move the cursor to the right of that. So there's roughly my x-intercept. I'm going to move to the right a little bit, press enter, and it draws a line there. So as long as that x-intercept is in between those two lines, when I press enter to get past the guess, it'll jump me to that line here. And this, in this case right here, what do I got here? The x value is negative one point. 5, 8, 5, seven, okay, yeah. Let's round that to the nearest tenth, negative 1.6. Okay, so one x-intercept here is negative 1.6. Now it's rounded, so it's approximate. Now, there is another one, this one. Let's do the same thing. Second, calc, to get into our, our menu here. I'm looking for the zero. This time, I'm going to move my calculator over sorry, my calculator, my cursor over. So this right here where I've got the cursor is roughly the x-intercept of that parabola. I'm going to move it to the left a little bit, press enter, go back, move it to the right a little bit, press enter, so that that x-intercept is in between those two. And when I press enter for a third time, it will jump my calculator to that particular value there, which in this case, again, to the nearest tenth is negative 4.4. All right, good. Now let's find the y-intercept. So we go back into the second trace or the calc menu. And like I said, we're going to use the value feature. And notice that the calculator is now waiting and saying x is equal to what here? Now the y-intercept here you can see is not on the screen. I think, I hope it's clear that it's going to be above the screen that I'm seeing here. If I enter in zero in for x, press enter, it tells me that the, the y-intercept here is 14. Okay, so that's well above the, the screen here. And just a little note here, the calculator has no problems finding points like that that are either above the screen or below the screen. But if you're looking for a y-intercept, for example, if, if you've adjusted your window settings for one reason or another, if the point that you're looking for, be it whatever, is to the left of the screen or to the right of the screen, you'll get an error. It won't work. It'll only work if that value is above the screen or below the screen. So the x coordinate has to be visible here. Okay, now these last two can be filled in quite easily. Uh, x is an element of the reals is going to be your domain. And then the parabola opens up, meaning we've got a minimum here, so the range is going to be y is greater than or equal to, and the minimum value here was negative 4, so greater than or equal to negative 4. And that's what you wanted to yank out of that. Okay, let's do one more uh, here with the calculator before we, we take a look at a different style of problem. 
So negative one half uh, x minus four squared plus three. And again, we'll walk, we'll walk this all through here. So I'm gonna go back, y equals, okay, we'll clear that. Just press the button clear. And then I've got negative one half. This time I will use uh, the negative button down here, by the way, because I'm starting with that, that symbol. So negative one half, uh, then it was x minus four squared plus three. So I've entered in my function here. It looks, the graph looks like I'm dealing with the same window settings. One, two, three, four, yeah, basically the same window settings. So I'm gonna press graph right now. I don't, shouldn't have to change anything. All right, there we go. So now I can see fairly clearly that the y-intercept here, one, two, three, four, five, it's going through like negative five it looks like to me. Okay. Looks like we've got our vertex here at one, two, three, four, one, two, three. But I knew that because I could tell from the equation. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. And my first x-intercept there is, it looks like it's roughly close to one and a half. So my parabola, when I put these together, is going to look something like this. Now, it goes right to the edge of the screen and then goes off. I know there's another x-intercept out here, but I can't see it. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that in a second. So first of all, the vertex. Let's use the calculator. Second trace. But this time, because the parabola opens down, this is going to be a maximum. So I'm going to move that cursor over. This is the maximum value right there. So I'm going to move my cursor to the left a little bit. Press Enter. That's what it's asking for. Now I'm going to move it to the right a little bit. No, to the right of that point. Press Enter so that that maximum is in between. And now I'm going to press Enter again to get past the guess. And I get this point 4, 3. Now don't worry about the zeros here. Just, just round that when you see a bunch of decimal places here. So that's going to be the point, whoops, 4, 3. Which means the axis of symmetry will be x is equal to 4 or x minus 4 equals 0. Uh, this parabola, because it opens down, has a maximum value, and the maximum value is going to be positive 3. Okay. Now, x-intercepts. Well, second trace, 0. Uh, well, I only see 1, so I'm going to move my cursor here. That's the y-intercept, that's right, x-intercept I'm looking for. So I'm going to move it to the left a little bit, press Enter, go back, move it to the right a little bit, Press enter, and when I press enter again, it will bounce back and forth between those two boundary points that I've just laid down there and find the x-intercept. In this case, it's negative, sorry, positive, positive, 1.6. Okay, so one of the x-intercepts here is 1.6. Second trace to get back into our calc menu, grabbing zero. Now. My other x-intercept here is somewhere over here. And I can tell this thing's coming down. It's going to cross again. I've got to go looking for it. So I'm going to move the cursor and I'm going to push it off the screen. Now as soon as I do this, the calculator kind of compensates and adjusts its window. This is the, thing that I'm, the, the point that I'm looking for, so I'm going to move to the left of it. Press Enter. Go back. Move to the right of it. Press Enter. I've got my two little triangles here. My x-intercept is in between the two of them. So now when I press enter, it takes me right to it. And the value here is 6.4 comma 0. So my other x-intercept here is going to be 6.4. Okay, good, wonderful. Now, let's talk about the y-intercept. So second trace to get into the calc menu. And this time we're going to use value. And Again, I can, I can see what the y-intercept is, but I'll just plug in zero here and see that it spits out the negative five. And we can see that from the beginning. Not a problem. But I want you to see how the calculator gets used for that. My domain will be x as an element of the reals. And my range, because this, this parabola opens down, the, the graph had a maximum value, so all other values will be less than or equal to that maximum, which is at three. Okay, now we're going to apply what we've just learned here uh, with the calculator and everything here to answer a question that is um, just kind of a practical application. Now, I don't know how often you'd run into a problem like this, but anyway, whatever. Here we go. A frog sitting on a rock jumps into a pond. 
the height h in centimeters of the frog above the surface of the water as a function of time t in seconds. Well, that's a whole lot uh, to say here. Um, can be modeled by this function. Basically, we're saying that the frog uh, jumps according to this particular function right here. It's been graphed, and now we're going to ask some questions about it. Now, we're being encouraged to use our calculator here too. So what I'm going to do is just enter in the equation as I see it. So I see negative, and again, I'm using this button here for the negative because it comes first. Negative 490 x squared plus 150x plus 25. All right, now, I would like to just press graph right now, but if I do and press graph, wow, that's uh, not a very helpful graph here. So I got to take a look at my window settings. What are they using for their window settings here? I'm going to go to my window and I'm going to make my window match what I'm seeing here. Now, according to the x coordinates, it looks like I'm going from 0 to 0.5 and I'm going up by 0 0.05. So this is going to be 0 to 0.5 and our tick marks here are going up by point, sorry, 0 0.05. Okay. My y minimum here looks to be negative 10. That's okay. But my y maximum here looks like it's going up to 45 and the graph appears to be going up by 5s. So 45 going up by fives. Now if I've interpreted the, the graph that they've given me here, what I get when I gra uh, press graph should be very, very similar to what we're seeing there. Okay? Yeah. Okay, that looks really good. Now we can go through and start answering these questions. What is the y-intercept? Okay. Well, the y-intercept, we know how to do that. We press second, trace, and I use the value function to find the y-intercept. It's asking me what's x equal to. I press zero, and it tells me that the y value here is 25. So the y-intercept here is 25. Now, what does it represent in this situation? Well, okay, the x-axis here is time. The y-axis here is height. So the y-intercept occurs when the x-coordinate is zero. So that means I am looking for a height, okay, when time is zero. Now that's, a, that's an okay answer here, but really what this is saying here is this is the initial height. Okay, the frog is about to jump. The frog was initially 25 centimeters up. All right, the next question says, uh, what maximum height does the frog reach? Okay, well, we know how to find that too. Second trace, we're going to use the maximum feature here. I'm going to move my cursor so it's, it's roughly over the position I want it to be in, which is somewhere here. The calculator is asking for a left bound, so I'm going to move my cursor to the left, somewhere there, press enter, go back, then move my cursor to the right, press enter. So as long as my maximum is somewhere between those two lines, when I press enter again, it will give me the maximum of, uh, you might have be having a hard time seeing that, 0.15 and 36.5. Now the y coordinate is the height, so that's going to be 36.5 uh, centimeters. The x coordinate is the time, which we see here as uh, 0. Point, actually 0. 0.2. Uh, seconds. Whoops, sorry, that's off the screen. 0 0.2 seconds. All right, next, when does, the surf, when does the frog hit the surface of the water? Okay, well, if you look up here, we're supposed to interpret this as being some sort of rock here. The y, sorry, the x-axis here is the water. So when I ask when does it hit the surface of the water, I'm looking for an x-intercept. So let's go back here. To find the x-intercept, it's, it's going to be second trace and we're going to use the zero fu uh, function here. That's the x-intercept. So we're going to move down to it. The calculator is asking for a left bound and then a right bound. So I go down to it. Now move to the left of it. Press enter. Move to the right of it a bit. Press enter. And as long as the x-intercept is in between those two boundary points, and the next time I press enter, it'll find it. And the answer is 0.4. Okay. Oh, so to the, sorry, this one said to the nearest hundredth here. So what does that round to? 0 0.43. Okay.
Okay, so the frog hits the water at 0 0.43 seconds. Good. So in this situation, what are the domain and the range? Okay, well, we just figured that out. We just at least figured out part of the domain. The frog starts jumping at, at zero and the, the jump ends at 0.43 seconds when he hits the water. Basically, the, the parabola doesn't continue to exist here. Like the frog didn't hit the water and then plummet through the water and then through the center of the earth sort of thing. Neither did the frog come barreling up from the center of the earth. This is where the frog starts. The frog's been sitting here for a long time and then decides to jump. Prior to this, mark, this point here, t equals zero, there's no parabola. After t equals 0 0.43, there's no parabola. So the parabola here only exists between zero and 0 0.43 seconds. The range, what was the range? Well, the range deals with the height but when we say this, we're talking specifically about the parabola. So again, the parabola only exists between here and here. So the y coordinates that we're getting here are going to be zero when the frog hits. And then it hits this maximum y coordinate. And we've already established that that maximum is 36.5. So the answer here is our range is going to be from zero out to 36.5 centimeters. Now, how high is the frog 0 0.25 seconds after it jumps? Okay, to the nearest hundredth. Okay, that's a great question. And actually, we've got a nice little tool in the calc for figuring that out. Press second calc or second trace to get to the calc menu. This is a value feature. Before we used value to find the y-intercept here, we would just plug 0 in for x. But now we're going to plug in 0.25 for x. And when we do that, we get 31. No, they want us to draw this to the nearest hundredth. So 31.88. 31.88 centimeters. Good. And how long is it over 30, 30 meters? Okay, I can guarantee you the frog did not jump 30 meters in the air. That should be centimeters. Okay. Now, how long is it over 30 centimeters? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't, I can't, I can't clearly see the 30 centimeter mark here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put uh, y equals, the 30 centimeters is a, a y value. So I'm just going to come down here and let y equal 30. When I press graph, it's going to draw this red line there. Now the frog jumps, it passes 30 and then comes back down and passes 30 again. I want to know how much time has passed since that uh, while the frog was above those, that, that line there. So what I got to do is I got to figure out when it first crossed it and when it comes back down. So I'm going to go back into my trace menu, my calc menu here. This is where I'm going to use intersect. So now the calculator asks for the first curve and the second curve. Now as long as the, the cursor is close to one of those points of intersection, that's what it's going to find. So I'll just move a little bit away so you can see this. The, the calculator is asking, am I on the first curve? And you press enter for yes. It will immediately jump straight down or straight up, but straight down here to the second curve. Am I on the second curve? Yes. Now it's going to ask if it can guess a value here. Don't worry about it. Just press enter to get past the guess. And it moves you very quickly to that point of intersection. Now that time there is 0 0.268. Okay? Now, what you might want to do, instead of writing that down, you just quit. If you type in X right now and press enter, the calculator will write that all down. Now, just leave that for right now. Leave that number. Let's go back into the graph. Now, I'm going to find this point of intersection. So, second trace, intersect. I'm going to come back. Because i got to move my cursor close to the point of intersection that I want. Now it's still asking me, am I on the first curve? Yes. Did I jump to the second curve you want? Yes. Press enter. Now press enter to get past the guess. And this time notice it jumps to this point of intersection. And it gives you this x coordinate. Now, now watch this. The x coordinate has changed. If you quit right now, I've got this old value here. But the x coordinate has changed since I've just written that. So I'm going to just uh, type in here subtract. The calculator will now take this number because ANS refers to the one you just found. 
But if I tell it to subtract x, because x has now been replaced by that new value, this should be the difference between those two times, and it gave me a zero. So, obviously that didn't work. Shoot, that should have worked. So what is x here then? Okay, so there are two different values of x here. I'm not entirely sure why that did what it did there. So I'm just going to grab this. I, you can go up with your calculator, as long as you've got a, a newer version, you can go up, grab that number, subtract, and then go up and grab that number that we just found. And when I press enter again, that gives me the difference between them. So uh, to the nearest hundredth, the frog has been above 30 centimeters for 0.23 seconds. Okay, so I'm not entirely sure why that didn't do what I wanted it to do. But anyway, so you get the idea. Okay, you can grab those numbers and kind of uh, list them down there and then use them. Now, if you, you can also go up and grab values as you want them. Okay, if you go up to here, for example, if I press enter, the calculator simply copies that down at the bottom. And actually, that's important to know that the calculator can do that too. All right, I hope that gives you a, a bit of a sense of what parabolas look like and how some of the tools on the calculator also work.